Thank you, brothers and sisters. We are continuing our study, uh, The Good Shepherd. And today I'll be looking at He Comforts Me. We'll be looking at He Comforts Me. This is Psalm 23, verse 4b. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How can your the rod and staff comfort? Well, first we'll get there in a moment. It's a continuation anyway of the focus that we had last week. And to put everything in context, the verse four completely says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I was blessed last week, I was blessed two weeks ago, and the week after, we will get, we'll get this thing. We're going to have 12 messages on Psalm 23. That's why today I'm just taking 20, Psalm 23, verse 4b. Let us look at comfort. We know what comfort means, but let, let me, let's define comfort because there are a few words there. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Apart from your, is twice. You have your, then you have rod. And, you know, so a few words. So let's look at comfort. Comfort is when you are put in a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. You are put in a state of physical ease. The rod and the staff, they put me in a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. Says your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When we listened to the message last week, I was so blessed. You know, the five times I decided to count, five times the writer, David, said, he is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness. Those five times, anybody can say. Anybody can say them. In fact, the prophet of Baal could have been able to say them. Because people now say it's the same God. But then, the changeover. But even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Not everybody can say that. That separates people. You are with me. Intimacy. We heard about it last week. If you missed it, check, look at it again. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Whose rod? Whose rod are we talking about? Let's look at what uh, John 10 tells us. This is... Uh, the other part of our text. I'll read. I am the good shepherd. That's Jesus Christ talking. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and causes nothing and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Praise the Lord. I just want to highlight three things there. Jesus said he is the good shepherd. He lays down his life. We know that now because Jesus died for our sins. He laid down his life. The next point, he says, my sheep know me as I know my father. I know my sheep. My sheep knows me as I know my father. Don't forget that he is one with the father. Jesus said in another part of the scripture, if you have seen me, you've seen the father. Another part, he said, I and the father are one. You see the enormity. When Jesus says, I know my sheep, 
and they know me. Just as I know the Father, it is huge, it is serious, it is thick, it is powerful. The last point I want to highlight is that they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock and one shepherd. Why am I talking about listening to God's voice? Because there are three voices. Your voice, the voice of Jesus, or the voice of the devil. I think we are contending with three voices. I will explain to you, or rather some examples we give in a short time, we make it very clear how we hear and authenticate the voice we are hearing, whether it's our voice or the voice of God. Praise the Lord. Like I said today, we are focusing on the rod and the staff of our good shepherd as a source of comfort. What do they represent? The staff and the rod were symbols of authority and responsibility. You can see the shape on the screen, the rod and the staff. They were symbols of authority and responsibility. The rod was used by ancient shepherds to protect their sheep from wild animals. It was a weapon to fight off attacking enemies that wanted to harm the flock, predators. It was not for beating up the sheep, as some might think. The shepherd took on the responsibility for fighting off attackers from his own sheep. The sheep did not have to fight for themselves. Praise the Lord. Our good shepherd is fighting for us. So like David, we are comforted. We don't need to fight for ourselves. Our good shepherd is fighting for us. David, at another psalm in Psalm 16, verse 11, says, you know, the, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand, I have, you know, blessings everlasting, pleasures everlasting. Look at David, a man talking. He's talking of everlasting, not just these pleasures are not just for now, everlasting. It takes them further. In his presence, fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forever. So where should I be? I should be in the presence of God. Where should you be? You should be in the presence of God. Praise the Lord. I want to say, though, that you can see the shape of the rod. Our God's rod, or the weapons of our God, is not always shaped like that. But it's powerful. In fact, I don't even know. Because it's a, a description by a shepherd, a, a, a successful shepherd, trying to describe how our God protects. Let me give you an example why I say that. Like when an angel, when Israel sinned and they had an, the enemies attacked them, one of the times, because very often, the king of Assyria got ready. He had a hundred, over 185,000 men. Hezekiah, the king, cried out to God. The Lord sent, sent Isaiah, who said, don't worry. It's not going to come in here. The direction that is coming through, he will go back through that. He will go back. So what happened? A night before, an angel made sure that 185,000 enemies did not wake up. I don't think he used that rod. If he used that rod, it would have been just one, you don't have enough time. Just 185,000. That is how great our God is. So when you are singing, our God is great, just know our God is awesome. Praise the Lord. The weapons of God are different. At times, the weapon of God may be just giving instructions. 
then we have to listen and obey. Like when Israel sinned again, Judges 6 and 7. Judges 6 says, and again Israel sinned. Whenever Israel sinned, punishment came for them. That's why, brothers and sisters, we are dealing with a holy God. We like him, half of him, we, don't, we can't take half. He's a holy God. He cannot cope with sin. Jesus Christ was revealed. He came to destroy sin. So when the people of God sinned, they opened the door for the enemies. The Midianites came. The Amalekites came. The men, soldiers from the East Country, they came to fight against Israel. When they came, they had impoverished Israel. If Israel planted some things, they came in with their cattle, they destroyed everything, they took the sheep, they took the goats. So Israel, the people of Israel were living in caves. Then one day, they repented, they cried out to God. The power of repentance is awesome. The power of repentance. They cried out to God. And God said, okay, I'm going to deliver them. It started with a man called Gideon. An angel appeared to Gideon. See, Gideon, long and short of it, God is going to deliver, use you to deliver Israel. Gideon said, how can he use me to deliver Israel? Well, I'm, my tribe is the young, is the least. I'm the youngest in my family. I think that family is, you know, is uh, like other families. You oppress the young ones. I'm the youngest in my family. You know, I, the, Lord, the angel said, you, you are going to be used to deliver Israel. He was seeing the angel. Then he said something. If what you are telling me is true, like today's world, you see, if I'm seeing right, please wait. Let me go and bring my offering. Wait for me. He told an angel to wait, and the angel waited. I tried to work it out. How long did the angel wait for? Well, he took a fresh goat, killed the goat, boiled the goat. He took flour, he made bread, and he brought it. That's more than an hour, at least. The angel waited. That's the first sign. There were three signs. That's the first sign that Gideon said, if you are going to use me, if what I'm seeing is true, wait for me. And he brought it. The angel said, okay, put it, put the meat and the bread on the rock. Pour the brought away. It's Judges 6. You can read it, the rest of it. As he touched the sacrifice with the staff, fire came and consumed the sacrifice, and the angel disappeared. Gideon said, oh, I've seen an angel. I'm going to die. The Lord appeared to him. Yeah, you're not going to die. I'm going to use you. Then Gideon was strengthened. Another time, Gideon said, if you are really going to use me, as the enemy gathered, and there were a lot of them, I put them at 135,000. God, if you are going to deliver Israel through my hands, let me put a wool, a woolen fleece on the ground. In the morning, I will see whether the fleece, the wool will be wet and the ground, surrounding ground, will be dry. If you do it, I will know it's a sign that it's you. Okay? Don't forget God had done one. He, did, he asked God. And God said, okay. The next morning he woke up. Everywhere was dry. He took the fleece. It was wet. He said, wow. Then he said, Lord, don't be angry with me. One more time. I'm going to put the fleece down. The next day, if all around the fleece is wet, but the fleece is dry, I will know that it's you that sent me. And the Lord said, okay. Why am I telling you these stories? 
In intimacy, you are not a dummy. When you are intimate with God, you can ask questions. Is your father? It was Gideon was able to say, Lord, don't be angry. Can I do this again? The Lord said, okay. So Gideon, three times, Gideon saw a demonstration of his spirit's power, God's power. He was strong. Then Gideon had 32,000 men. It was still okay to fight against 135,000. What happened? The Lord came again and said, Gideon, these men are too many. Say to them, whoever is afraid, go back home. Whoever is afraid, go back home. 22,000 went back. 10,000 was left. The Lord said, Gideon, there are still too many. At the point, at, you know, please think as you are listening to me. So, do you want to kill me? Is this suicide? There are still too many. Okay? The Lord said, I will separate them for you. Take them to a stream. Those that kneel down to drink water, send them home. Those that lap the water, I will take them. 9,700 were asked to go home. 300 left. If it was in a local place or painting, if you had 32,000 people and you take 300 away, the house, the, 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 the town will still be full. People will not know that many people have left. The high street will still be populated. Only 300. Then God visited him again. He said, in case you are afraid to attack, because you are seeing 135,000, God had whittled it down to 300. In case you are afraid to attack, take your servant. Go and listen to what they are saying in the enemy's camp. That is alone. That's dangerous. They could just catch both of you. And the people, the 300 waiting for you, or the 299, if you know, the 298 will not even know where is Gideon, he's gone, they're captured by the enemy. He went to listen. There, as they got there, the enemies, two people were talking. One had a dream. I had a dream. And it wasn't Martin Luther. I had a dream. The other one said, What is the dream? He said, I saw a big loaf of barley bread come tumbling down, hit our tents, destroy things. And the interpretation was from his friend. His friend said, that must be God fighting for Gideon. So when Gideon heard that, he worshipped God. That alone, you worship God, enemies are there. I will run away first. I will go far from the enemy. He worshipped God. And he went. Do you know, at this time, I became slow in my preparation. I wanted to shout. Gideon got there. He said, okay, uh, 300, I divide you into three. Watch me. Watch me. If, if you don't, you, you're not intimate with God, you can't say, watch me. And then he gave them weapons. Trumpet. Empty jar and a torch. That is, you know, a trumpet, empty jar. No, you look at it, it's empty. And a torch. He said, watch me. That guy had been with God. Had been with God. Some people say, I'm praying about something. It's your voice. When you really pray, Wait. Anyway, let's continue. Watch me. You know the rest of the story. See, whatever I do, you do it. Okay? Just at the point, they blow the trumpet, they throw down the empty jar, raise the torch, and set a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. 
the people started woke up, they started killing themselves. Nature started killing themselves. One goal, I think uh, by my calculation, 120,000, you know, just killed themselves. They fought against themselves. This Gideon and the, you know, the 300 hadn't done, they didn't do anything. They were just killing themselves. So 15,000 was left. The king now ran somewhere. Because one day his sons killed him, two of his sons killed him, and the third son took over. Can you imagine? I don't think the road was that ship, but awesome in power. Praise the Lord. Or oh, still, you know, it may be God's broad to fight off our enemies and give us comfort. Maybe like David, when he, when he was he was fleeing from Saul, he was in Ziklag. Enemies attacked and took away everything. David lost everything for himself. Those following him, he lost everything for them. Their children, their animals, everything. Then David overheard the discussion of his execution. But the Bible says he found strength. He found comfort in the Lord. The Lord directed him. They recovered everything that was lost. You know the story. But that's how God fights for us. Praise the Lord. Let us see what Romans 8, 31 to 39 tells us. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered we are as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is most comforting. Praise the Lord. You will notice, brothers and sisters, all we have to do is to be in Christ on his terms, away from sin. In all those things, nothing can separate us, but we have to be away from sin. They didn't mention sin there. Sin, just the children of Israel will be any time they sinned. Problem. We know it ourselves. We experience it. Why don't we now tell ourselves, like Apostle Paul told uh, Timothy, train yourself to be godly. Train yourself not to do this thing. Pray, God help me. Stay away from it. You know it. I know it. The things that trouble me, the things that are not right. I come before God. Irene led us in prayer today. Nobody, no Christian, Nobody, whatever name you call him, prophet, apostle, whatever, gets to get beyond every day saying, Lord, search me. The reason is that when you are a Christian, you don't die immediately, right? You are still in the world. The temptations are there. Your brother will niggle you. Your sister will niggle you. There will be some who will say, okay, Christmas is coming. Maybe I won't send you a card. You know? 
You come to God. God, what do you say? Help me. Yeah. Every nobody. Some people want to be big men in church. I'm a pastor. The plat- what is the same thing. You go to God to check you out. The more you do it, the less sin can land and have root in your life. The devil is not sleeping. You saw the way Gideon checked it out. God, is this you? If it is you, you can check it out as yourself. Don't be spiritually lazy. Things, I want to know, I want to do this. Pray about it. Pray about it. I don't have time to give you examples of, I had to learn it. For my marriage, you know, I had to learn it. When God spoke to me, to the church, you know, to stop my job. If, if God tells you, well, just give up your job and go full time. Make sure it's God. If not, your wife will tell you whether you are, you should go and see your parents or you are, or you go and see the doctor. You know, they will, you let, they will let you know. Here, pray. Pray. And if you know somebody who's getting it wrong, pray for the person. You can check it out. Gideon checked it out. Gideon knew it was going to be made a minced beef if he got it wrong. And some people, I think it was Edward that preached about the seven sons of Sceva, who thought they could try it out to cast out demons in the name of Jesus that Paul was preaching. The demons came out of the man and beat them up, disgraced them. They, they had to go to town without clothes. Yeah, if you go to the town center without clothes, you are finished. You should just relocate. Because anytime you go, people say, that guy, they won't even, if you stay in the shop, they will all go out. Because the seven, they were beaten. That's how to put one leg in, one leg out. You are not sure. You can be sure. In Christ, you can be sure. And everybody is the same. There is no, no Pope, no Pilate, there is no professor. All of us, no pastor, all of us are the same. If you are in Christ, you are in a safe place. Outside Christ, you are on your own. If you, the three voices, the voice of Satan, your own voice is the killer. There's still one example. We'll see how the voice of man works. What about the staff? The staff of a shepherd is, you know, was used to guide and correct wandering sheep in order to keep them on the straight and safe path. You see the lungs? Yeah. To guide them, to keep them on the straight path. That's the staff. Yes, the Lord has something like a staff. Another example in 2 Samuel 24. David. David, the children of Israel committed sin as well. But, and David too. But you know what they say? Pride comes before the fall. One day David told the chief commander, go and count all the men in Israel. The commander said, you know, why do you need to, why do you have to do this? Uh, the king said, go and count them. So it took over nine months. They counted all the men in Israel and Judah. They came back. I think there were 800,000 men in Israel and 500,000 men in Judah. You know what that means? This, are, this is my strength. Israel has, not, has never worked like that. God has routed enemies that were more and bigger than that. I was just telling you, one 85,000 just died overnight. Instead of coming up, let us fight them. You tell, come up, oh, he's dead, come up, he's dead. If, if 185,000 people die, you know, around someone, you, will, you yourself will wake up shouting. That's if you wake up, if you're not part of the dead. You wake up, everybody is dead, everybody is dead. Then David went to count. As soon as they brought the report to him, he knew he had done it wrong. And the prophet was there. The prophet said, God said you should choose three things. Let famine, the first one, come on this land for three years. 
You choose that. Or let your enemies pursue you. They come after you. You are running away from, they will pursue you for three months. Or I will send the plague for three days. David said, Lord, don't give me over to men. You have mercy. Men don't have mercy. My enemies don't have mercy. Sin always brings repercussion. Brothers and sisters, me included, when are we going to learn? When? He has given us all things. The only thing he says we should not do is sin. If you are struggling with something, say, Lord, help me. I want, it has to be his way. It's his kingdom. Don't forget, you know, it was a kingdom. It was a kingdom of, we're all going to the kingdom of darkness. He came and rescued us into his kingdom. With that sin in heaven, he drove Satan and a third of the angels out. So the same God is not going to tolerate sin. So how do you get away from saying, Lord, help me? And when you pray, you will know. You, compare, you put your life with the word of God. Disobedience, what is not right. Because what God has for you is good. What is taking you away from what God has for you is sin. So we embrace God. God's correction and discipline proves his love and our belonging. And so this brings comfort. That's why David said, Lord, you deal with us. Don't hand me, us over to the enemy. Look at what Hebrews says. Hebrews 12, 46. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. We thank God in King's Church. We have prayed, we've now prayed publicly. Thank you, Lord, for correcting us. It's true. If he doesn't correct you, you know you are dead already. You, are, you, are, you know there are some things you have done wrong, decisions you have made, and it's not correcting you. You say, Lord, have you left me? He says, because he loves you, he will correct you. The staff is also generally seen as a symbol of authority and power. That staff, symbol of authority and power. Brothers and sisters, we come across, once we are in Christ, like Irena prayed, we do it on his terms. It's not you in charge of the king. He is in charge of the kingdom. You follow the person who, who, is the, who knows the way, who is the way the truth and the life. You follow him. If you take a different turn, you will not get to the destination. To be in Christ, brothers and sisters, is easy. You just fight against yourself. You want to be outside. No, this is where I belong. This is where I belong. One day, about 42 years ago, Pearl and I had, you know, recently married, and uh, we wanted to help somebody. And the person, you know, came to stay in a house. Uh, the, the, actually, the first house we moved into, because we were in the postgraduate hall before then, and we moved to our first house, as we stayed in the spare room. But we soon noticed that the person had demonic powers, it was, the person was terrible. So we don't give up. As we do in our prayer meetings, we do not give up. We're praying for the person, praying for the person. And God just gave the grace. Anytime the person was visited by her evil partners, we would know. 
don't ask me why. If you are in this situation, God will tell you. You will know. One day, the person just announced to us that she had to kill us that night. She just had to kill us that night. That was it. The grace and comfort of God just rose within me. I told her, no problem. I mean, we are in Christ. If you can penetrate the covering that Christ says he gives us in him, go ahead. We slept. And you can see, for 42 years, we are still relaxing. <laughs> yes. You see, you can come and sing. You can come and read the Bible. You can come and sing. When you ask Gideon. Gideon saw the angel. Gave food and everything. But as human beings, he said, please, let me check again. Let me check again. Three, check, three major checks. It's okay for you to sit down there and think, Gideon, the first check was enough. Didn't you see that everything, fire came and the, the angel disappeared? Gideon was a man like you and me. But God wasn't angry with him. So we can check. If not, we'll do what seems right to us. That's the voice of man. It seems right. He looks good. She looks good. This decision is good. There was, why? This is for everybody. The story is told of a, a pastor who said, God told him he was going to be the next president of a country. That's, you no, know, that's clear. There's no, so God told him. You know, Christians, once you say, God has told me, you back off. God told me that I'm going to be the next president. Then the registration, just, just the registration for the various parties, he paid equivalent of 200,000 pounds just to get the registration to contest just, just his own party. Yeah, that translates to a lot of money back home. Some people are laughing because they know the conversion rate and also they know that it was a hundred million uh, money. So to, I, I did the calculation actually to make sure it was close to 200,000 pounds. Then, in his party nomination, nobody voted for him. This brother, this pastor, remains a brother. Did he check? Was it God or was, was it his voice? This is how costly your voice can be. Is still a brother. 200,000 pounds. If I, if I tell everybody here, if you, if I give me 200,000 pounds, then you will see that it's either your house, you lose your house, even as you are sitting here. 200,000 pounds is a lot of money. He just lost it. Just like that. We have gone back to God like Gideon. God, please. Is it you? He announced it. God told me. So they started making fun of him. Was it God? Uh, was it himself? Or did he know God? No. He said, brother, he just heard his voice. You have ambitions. I have ambitions. My ambitions are not what God has said. But when I'm in Christ, I say, God, what do you want for me? No, we do not get greater power and authority than the one that our good shepherd and our Lord Jesus has. Authority, the greatest and the best ever. See how he puts it himself. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely 
I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is why as a church, everything we do, if you notice, is in obedience to this, to make disciples and to pray. Check it out. People can make things complicated. Anything we do. We are here to pray, to make you better disciples who make disciples, to make me better disciples, a better disciple who makes disciples. That's what the Lord says. He said, all authority. What is, what is in all that we don't understand? All authority in heaven and on earth. There are some all these people who have partial authority. They are so strong, they're in their land. I'm a king of this land. I'm the president of Russia. I'm the president of America. America has a location. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth, including your country, heaven, has been given unto me. Therefore, go. So when people I want to say, okay, let some people go. I don't know. No, we are here to help you. We are all on the same journey. Like I said before, everybody here, no matter what you do, for me to help, we share the gospel. We pray for people who want to make them disciples, who make disciples. We are alongside each other. Something I did not tell you, I, I rather I omitted from that Gideon story. He said the, the, the 300, they should stand their ground. Stand their, they stood their ground. The trumpet, they had already lost the, the empty jar anyway, threw it on the ground, and they picked it up. Stand your ground. We help each other to stand our ground. Don't position me where I'm not. I am moving. I want to make heaven. I want you to make heaven. I want you to be a disciple who makes disciples. That's what it is. If not, check the Bible. Check the Bible. Just keep it simple. Keep obeying God. Thank God last week, two people gave their lives to Christ. We want to enable you to, in your place of work, to pray, to talk to people. You are the Jesus that people see in your place of work. Most of the time, I can't come. We have people here who work in big offices and things. Edward is here. For me to see him, they come, I will wait, and they call him to come and see me in the common room. I, I can't just go and visit him in his, uh, in, where he's, uh, he's having surgery. Or do I go and the doctor's here, you're in the theater, I come and visit you. It's not like that. You are, you, in Christ in you is Christ operating in those places. God has called us to a simple and powerful thing. While we submit to him on these terms, open our hearts and obey him, we will see transformation. Mark's gospel says, and he went with them, confirming his word. If you want to see big miracles, be, put yourself in Christ and then be obeying Christ. You will see incredible miracles. You people will come to you. You just you are just obeying God and giving Him the glory. In conclusion, very quickly, there's three things I put out here, which I've already talked about. Be sure you are in Christ. What does that mean? It means to be born again, to believe in Christ. Ask him to forgive you your sins. Repent of them. That's turn away. Because if you don't repent of them, you are still on your own. No matter how much you sing and how much you know scripture, if you don't turn away, when you repent, it says, I give you two gifts. I forgive you and I give you the gift of salvation. Then remain there. Remain there by obeying him, asking for help. He's giving us a helper. His, his, his helper is not foreign. His, the helper he has given us is his spirit. It's still the same Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is the helper. We ask him. We help us overcome sin, overcome hurdles. We ask him things. He will tell us. He will direct us to scripture. We stay there. And finally, we tell others, don't keep good news to yourself. 
Even the lepers in the Bible did not keep good news to themselves. They want to tell. Tell others. Christ came to die for everyone. But only those who believe, accept, repent, will be saved. But he's come to die for everyone. And it's for he himself went around telling people, told his disciples, and you are now his disciple who should also go and tell others. Praise the Lord. Let us pray.